I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of every branch, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I wanted to choose. And as I stood there, waiting, make, trying to make up my mind, I realized that choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, plopped to the ground at my feet. This is an excerpt from Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, where she discusses the inner turmoil of choosing a path to pursue. This conflict has been fundamental to me, as I'm sure it has been for all of you as well in the last few years. When I was seven, I wanted to be a pop star. I wrote what I thought were brilliant song lyrics and worked on my killer choreographies, later amounting to weekly singing lessons, which I participated in for two years. But by that point, at 13, it was already too late. I had decided I wanted nothing more than to become a vet and take care of animals, even with a deathly allergy to cats. I know there are people out there who played with stethoscopes in their childhood bedrooms and later grew up to become incredible doctors, but unfortunately, for the most of us, this just isn't the case. Choosing subjects that I wanted to pursue at 14 for the next four years seemed very simple then. And my unwavering certainty in the decisions that I was making at the time gave me no warning signals that I would then spend a lot of time trying to accommodate them. I had decided I wanted to study pure chemistry or forensic science in university, having taken no less than zero chemistry classes and instead working off the principle that forensic science seemed pretty cool in all the crime movies that I had seen. So I took all three sciences. By the time the IGCC exams were around the corner, COVID was rampant and we had very little classes in person. This I struggled with particularly because I lost my motivation and concentration after the first few months. When we finally arrived at the consensus that we were to be given predicted grades, the school decided to compile what essentially were full IGCSE exams into one week. This was a third of our predicted grade. I was struggling to stay afloat and ended up sacrificing, taking history officially as I felt I could not finish revision for both chemistry and history. At the time, this felt like the correct decision to make. Now, about to attend university for politics and international relations, it seems ridiculous at best. In this same period, and over the summer of 2021, I began to question the decisions I had made. I was doing very well in my subjects, and as sciences like chemistry and physics are considered very difficult, I thought it would be a shame not to continue on with them. However, I noticed that my friends, who were also pursuing these science-based futures that I wanted so much, were much more enthusiastic than I was about them. I felt I was there just because I was very good at it, not because I really wanted it. External influences, as well as my own subconscious, pushed me towards what I thought was a safe choice or a safe path. One day in late spring, I recall what could only be best described as a spiral in which I felt an inexplicably large urge to pursue something that I truly loved. I loved film and I still do. I wanted to broaden my horizon and finally to consider the tangible possibility that I might want to pursue filmmaking or directing or cinematography or screenwriting. Particularly, I wanted something where I was allowed to be creative while also playing to my strengths, which generally centered around writing. I wanted to write plays that evening, to write songs like I did when I was seven. I wanted to explore a realm I never felt I fully could. This feeling did not excite me in the way that it should have because I felt my future was out of my control. The school, societal influences, and my own decisions years prior had decided my fate for me. I had no choice to pursue drama, not to IGCSE. We did not have art, nor did we even have PE as a result of the pandemic. I know the school has grown since then, providing the younger students with much more opportunities than we had, but I was not part of this fortunate group. I was heading towards a future I definitely did not want and needed to make a change. I expressed these feelings of entrapment to my parents, who not only supported me with my decision to pursue film, but also began to seek out opportunities for me. There was only one teacher of the media studies A-level in the entirety of Romania. 
and I was driven by my determination to find this teacher and make her my teacher. This course that allowed me to create a portfolio will come incredibly handy down the line, as you will see. So I began doing two-hour sessions weekly in the October of 2021, while also taking four A-levels at school, one of them being computer science, as I both intended to keep my options open, but also feared the possibility of an entirely scienceless future. The coursework component of media was brand new territory for me, and it took months for me to become accustomed to it. The, in, the vast majority of my education has been exam-centric, so doing something more vocational was quite difficult to grasp. As a result, it was not easy to perfect my work, which is something that I particularly grappled with as I am very much a perfectionist. As part of my coursework, I had my own website and wrote thousands of words using theory I had learnt over the course of a few months, not, not under timed conditions, but under this large research project that was half of my A-level. The research aspect particularly was time consuming and interfered with the little time that I had free outside of school. My friends can testify that any time they'd call me, I was writing for media. In addition to this, my major task was to create my own magazines, which included photos, articles, and an original fresh new idea. I had to coordinating shooting sessions, makeup artists, studios, all as part of my coursework and entirely alone. After this was all done, I had to write four long essays on questions Cambridge had asked about my creative choices. Even the exam, which was the component I thought I would be entirely used to, proved to be entirely new territory for me. I had to analyze scenes from films in the exam room, having no idea what would be presented to me. All of this, I did for no reason. Not really for no reason, but I didn't have to do it. I could have stopped at any moment. I could have given it 20% of my effort, 60% even, but I didn't. I never, never gave it less than my absolute all. And I persevered even during times where I felt it was suffocating. I learned to manage my time better, eliminate distractions, and most importantly, provide myself with these well, well needed breaks. I now still take this to A2 level. You may be wondering where exactly all of this got me. I sacrificed my free time, the sports I used to play, and often my mental stability as well. I took the risk and I persevered through periods of time where I felt I had to be solely self-motivated, something which I know that can be quite tricky to really learn, to really feel. People have the tendency to do the bare minimum, which granted, generally does not fail. But I want to give you all the feeling that you should strive for the best, not for anyone or anything other than making yourself proud. Apart from that, there are very tangible effects of all my effort. So where did it get me? In October last year, I was in Munich attending a concert of a band I like. The evening before the concert, my parents and I were eating in the hotel's restaurant. At some point, my mum begins squinting at me. Following, followed by a series of nearly inaudible whispers. Is that him? I heard her ask my dad. My dad then put on his glasses and proceeded to do his own squinting from the table behind us. And they came to the consensus together that the man behind us was, in fact, the editor of British Vogue, Edward Enninful. My mum had seen him do an interview with Timothy Chalamet the day before. <laughs> my mum, notoriously fearful of wasted opportunities, she thinks very subtly, but it was not very subtle at all, hinted to me that she thought I should go speak to him as he leaves. Absolutely not, is what I replied. And although a part of me wanted to seize this opportunity, the greater part of me that is deeply afraid of bothering anyone silenced it. About an hour later, when I was in my hotel room, my mum proceeded to call me, letting me know she went up to speak to him herself. Not only that, but she had shown him me, t told him about me and my affection for writing and journalism, to which he responded, if she has any work of her own, she can send it to me. I was taken aback, to say the least. So I did. I messaged him links to my coursework and my magazine and my website, and my opportunities widened in that moment. The possibility of an internship at British Vogue. I have to thank my mum for being much braver than I am, and taking the risk I was not willing to. 
Around a month later, I discovered the possibility of doing some form of course over the summer. I had already done a few the previous summer, but I wanted to aim even higher as it was my last year to apply as a high school student. After some diligent Googling, I began writing essays in response to admission questions from Stanford Summer School. I looked into Harvard, Columbia, and NYU and aimed to apply to them before their early action deadlines. This meant a lot of work and very quickly, but it did increase my chances of admission. Late November, however, I stumbled across none other than the New York Times' Summer Academy, something I had no idea even existed. I have been dreaming of a future career at the New York Times and just the mere possibility for years. Obviously, this jumped out to me and I did everything I could to apply before the early deadline. Bear in mind, my faith was non-existent as it is incredibly competitive and literally the New York Times. It took me over a month to write multiple essays on their questions as well as providing them with my own ones. They wanted my grades and all other sorts, but I still sent it in before the first deadline. A month ago, they sent me an email accepting me to study investigative journalism in New York over the summer, along with acceptance letters from Sanford and Columbia. I will reside in housing near Central Park, attend classes taught by Pulitzer Prize winners, and visit the actual New York Times headquarters. The realization has yet to sink in, and I doubt it will until I'm on American soil. Thank you for listening. And if you take one thing from this, I would like everyone to leave no stone unturned. No aspiration is too big.